Read in the bed. Read in the bed. He lurked in the shadows, waiting and hoping she wouldn't take a different room. This was a usual room. He knew that. He knew her. Ghost of Me. The new book by Amanda Steele can be found at Amazon, Cobol, Waterstones, and many, many other places. Read in the bed. 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 And Amanda Steele. And how many different podcasts are we on together, Amanda? 29. I thought just said, well, this is no, the 29th. different podcast series, I should prefer. A lot. Yes. <laughs> well, um, I do four, don't I? You do, you're on three of them. Yeah. So it just shows you. And what's this podcast, Amanda? We review books. Yeah. Uh, Our books? Well, we kind of did that once, didn't we? <laughs> I got a bit narcissistic. Yeah, on your, on your own book, <laughs> no, yeah. No, I wasn't reviewing it, though. It was more of a reading. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Well, like I said, that's the course in, is our podcast where we review a variety of books every month, don't we? So, yeah. Now, anybody that obviously follows our podcast, what do we do before we go to our first book review? We ramble on about all the stuff that we've done. No, oh, yeah, and what have we done, Amanda? We've done a lot this month. Yeah, ladies first. I have an interactive story coming out where you get to choose your own adventure and it's called How to Write Your Own. Yeah, where did this book come from, Amanda? It came from a number of things where you just pick up things mm. not to do. And it was just going to be a sort of comedy book and then I thought, I'm going to do it so you can have it as an interactive thing and pick which way you go. Now, of course, anybody that knows Amanda's style this most definitely is a sequel, or not a sequel in a style, in a sort of, you know, you're on one of them, don't yeah, you? Yeah, it's the same style as uh, 12 Deaths of Father Christmas, which is very dark, sarcastic humour. Yeah, very Yorkshire, sure, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's why, so, obviously, it's it's not like the 12 Deaths of Father Christmas, where there's 12, there are 12 of the short stories. This could lead you in probably 12, 13 different ways, couldn't it? Yeah, there's quite a few different directions you can go in depending on which choices you pick. All of them are wrong, obviously. That's why it's called How to Write Wrong. Yeah. Now, with this, um, you've done two live versions of it so far, haven't you? Yeah, we did quite a lengthy one that was almost 20 minutes. Yeah. And then Um, we did a very short one that was over in about five or six minutes. Yeah. And it'll give you a clue when you're doing these sort of venture books like that. um, How long the journey's going to end up going, which is the correct way of doing it. What made you want to do Choose Your Own Adventure book? I applied for a project last year and it had to be something innovative and then I had to teach myself how to do the links in the Word document so that you can click on it and it takes you to the thing so many pages on it. And then I thought, well, now I know how to do that. I can actually do that for a Kindle. Yeah. Um, it's available in the paperback as well, but for the Kindle you, you can actually just click on the links rather than skip forward to the pages. What did you actually read any of Choose Your Own Adventure books growing up? Yeah, I grew up reading them. I wonder, I know what obviously like, people would know, obviously, from our Gavin, my brother, who's only a little bit older than you, so this is what like seven and a half years between me and you in age. It wasn't really my generation, it was more of the 80s, yeah. 80s childhood. We, we didn't have a local library like you do, and seem to have a lot of local libraries in little areas now, don't you? Yeah. We had a library book that was there on a certain date and a certain time. So on my way home from school, you'd like run to the library bus and you'd like look at all the children's books and pick which ones that you wanted oh, to take out. Right, right, and you right. might have like half an hour before the library bus is asked to leave and go somewhere else. So you've got to quickly get there and pick your books. And you come back the next week to return them and get more books. Right, I understand that. I never, I never knew that. So, of course... Anybody knows Amanda knows this isn't the only thing she's got coming up, is it? No, I have a short poetry book, a chat book called, um, I forgot what it's called now, Always Darkest Before Dawn. I don't know, I don't know what it's called. All I know is Bleak yeah. Book, right? Yeah, it's called Always Darkest Before Dawn, and it's not that bleak actually, because there's a couple yeah. of positive poems in there as well, but it's a mixture. Now, I'm just wondering now, the microphones have started melting in shock here. I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Now, obviously, where did this idea come from? Well, we was doing the Poetry Month in April, 
and obviously there's a lot of down in the pandemic so it's going to be influenced by that and I had three poems and I thought I'm on my way to doing a chat book here so I didn't really try to sit down and think I've got to write about the lockdown I just used it just to get everything down and some were more positive than others yeah how many is in your chat book then poetry wise there's 20 poems which a good going really so it's you pretty well started in April didn't you really so it's, it's all wrote reasonably at the same period well, most of them were written in April I think one was written near the end a couple were written near the end of March and a couple were written just sort of after the poem of day thing finished now there's other news from you as well isn't there yeah unfortunately we've been in our last issue of printed words <laughs> yeah but we're still going to be there we're doing other projects like we're doing a charity book and we'll probably do other things in the future but it will be the last time we'll bring out a magazine yeah unfortunately guys it's time to move on basically so the thing is the way i was looking at all the man this before is and this has been honest to everybody is we've done six issues this bit wasn't it so yeah, I think it will be, yeah. Six issues. And we've been doing them quarterly, so you work it so it's been yeah. an eight, it's been a year and a half. I've been, I've been doing it for a year and a half now. And sometimes you always find like sometimes it's best for them to move on from a project before it starts going downhill. If you get say you can only peak at certain things sometimes I think. And I think we have both learned a lot from it and there's things that we've learned from it certainly can't repeat here. But we've we've learned how to deal we've made a lot of friends in this magazine now. Yeah, yeah, there's people I wouldn't even have known about if it weren't for being in this magazine now. Yeah, same for me as well. Like it's all in case I probably knew some, but but again, we've met people through the magazine, so it's been it's been a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of people that we do know as well to like bring them on board to the magazine and give them a chance to help out, and I think they've enjoyed it mostly. No one's ever said, "Oh, that was horrible." Your magazine's a pile of doo doo. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, I've never heard that. But no, either way, I said, "Watch your space, guys." It's been a pleasure. So, right, of course, I've got news, Amanda, haven't I? Yeah. You've been busy as well. Now, what watching you should I tell them first? Uh, whichever you prefer. Okay, well, it's hard to blame on her, isn't it? Like I told you this, uh, my ten, 10 years ago now, I was in my very first book, I was Yeah. And I was, I was going back for that, was in March, just for the, plan, the pandemic started up. And I was amazed how long ago it wasn't. I decided at the time, well, I wanted to bring a reissue of the first book because various reasons it dropped out of print on a couple of sites and I was going to do like a big reissue of it but then I decided to, to was it typical me this matter is it to go back and re-edit the whole book basically and do some quite major re-edits in some places because it was I think you find don't you when you go back to your first book sometimes it's you look back in 10 years down line and you're like why have I done that yeah so but what I did it was I wanted to look at things in a different way in the book so I basically pulled a few poems out of it and the book itself is now somehow 107 pages on Amazon. Well, it was originally 50 odd pages, so I put in quite a bit of related material at the yeah. time. So. And you've learned how to put books onto Kindle as well, haven't you? Yeah, yeah that was an, an interesting experience. <laughs> that's for sure. So <laughs> that was for sure. But no, that's been ple- for the pleasure of us. I've really, I've really enjoyed doing it. The book's now out. Uh, before the next podcast gets released, I'm actually bringing out a chapel for myself, aren't I? Yeah. Yeah, I thought, I didn't know. Um, was it Selected <laughs> Scenes of the End of the World? Or it was something about the end of the world. I yeah. did the cover for you as well. Yeah, I think it was Selected Scenes from the End of the World. Now, this one's. This, this is, it sounds like I've just wrote this a month, haven't I? But the title of it. Yeah. But the book itself is actually a couple of years old, where. Because I, when we're working from home now, of course, I, before I started working from home, I had basically six weeks where I couldn't leave the flat. I had enough to do from work. I still can't leave the book now, but like I said, but it's, I had sit, best I thought, it gave me a chance to sit down and go back and look at a few old projects that are incomplete. This one nearly came out with the publisher, I was telling that, frankly, showed the true colours and I didn't, I didn't release it with them. But um, so, but it, I looked back at it and I thought, oh, I can, I can, it was one of those ones where you looked at it and I could sort this out with a couple of ways and I did. So they're all like tiny little poems, most of under 10 lines. And it kind of follows on from like, you know, Street to All We Can See yeah. book. I almost read that book. These are all very tiny poems again, but all linked in together. It was 13 of them, if correct, where look, all looking at the end of the world. Not like trying to stop it, just people, human reaction, where they're accepting it and trying to just live their life, basically. Yeah. What comes next? So. And I've got other stuff on the way as well, haven't we? So in June and July. So. Yeah, I've heard there'll be more to come. Yeah, plenty more, because when we're still under lockdown, but I've got time for writing and sorting bits and pieces out. 
But anyway. So now we're going to start talking about a book. Yeah. This is called Reading in Bed. Yeah, not Waffling in Bed, right? So, <laughs> okay, Amanda. What is, who is the first book? Try. It's a book by John Bishop and it's called How to Grow Old, A Middle-Aged Man Mourning. Before I read the blurb, I'll do the blurb so I can see it here. What made you pick this book out? Did I've read put... his first book, which I think was called How Did This Happen? Because I was a fan of his anyway, because I like his comedy. Don't you like him, man? You're not, don't you? <laughs> not like that, no. <laughs> uh, he's, a, he's a bit of an idol to me, actually, because I know he's gone into comedy and I'm writing, but he's got into this quite late, so I do look up to him, because it's just shown that it doesn't matter yeah. like what age you get into, whatever it is that you want yeah. to do. Yeah, if you're good enough, you're, too late. Yeah, if you're good enough, you're old enough, whatever age, yeah. Right, I've got the blurb here, okay, so I'll read the blurb. How to grow old is a stupid title. Well, that's true. <laughs> because the answer is obvious, don't die. But if I you don't die, you're growing old. So, don't come to this book under any illusions. It isn't going to tell you how to stay alive any longer. It won't help you understand the aging process from a sociological and anthropological perspective. But I'm not sure how much more practical advice you're going to get. However... If you want to know what a white heterosexual middle-aged man thinks of growing old, but will struggle to stay fit, keep hold of friends, and stay relevant to why I'm getting better doing a, doing a dump now that they tell my life, this book could be exactly <laughs> what you're looking for. You might even find it a bit funny. Scraps. Okay, so I like the fact that it starts off and he actually admits to having a ghostwriter. So a lot of people would just pretend they'd written the whole thing themselves. Yeah, we talked about that, and we were talking about that, because... But you said already that you, know, you could feel from the beginning of it, yeah. couldn't you? Yeah, it seems to be more of a, just like he's put out his ideas to the ghostwriter and then he's typed it up for him, but it's still John Bishop's voice and his words just maybe tidied up a little bit and then typed out because he's, he admits he's not great at typing, which is fair enough. Yeah, it felt like all long really, and it was, it, I've got a fault to the book, I'll be frank, but it... It's one of those books where it's an easy to read book to answer straight away, I think. What do you think then? What else did you like about it? There was some stuff I could understand. Obviously, I can't relate to all of it because I'm not a middle aged man. I am. Um, I am but I, I'm, I'm close to becoming a middle aged woman. <laughs> <laughs> so I can still relate yeah. to some of the bits. Well, so not specifically he's the male bits. He's 52, 53 is territory, wasn't he? Yeah, so yeah. I'm 48 now. So I've yeah, been into that area myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it said, was there any, any bits that you liked? Kick the stories you liked in it? I, was, I, I really like the way all the stories are told. There's nothing where you think, oh, that's fantastic, but he's a very good storyteller and he can make anything sound interesting, I think. I found it was one of those ones where, I'll come into this in the faults more, but my favourite story in the book was the one about his, when he his mates came to watch him in Edinburgh. Yeah. <laughs> that was the funniest scene in the book for me where, and there's nothing to hide in that one. They started and um, they kind of filled up half his audience, his first audience at the end of the fringe. Yeah, I mean, they like, they meant well, but they just kind of made things worse. Yeah, they started shouting out, why did you tell this story? Yeah. And he lost his audience and they left it. I, 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 can Im- I can imagine my family doing that, coming to see me and like my mum shouting out, oh, that book's not very good, isn't it? <laughs> or something. Yeah, not your mum, yeah. Sorry, Owen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could agree with that one. So, yeah. But that's the one, the one and, um, that was really funny. I felt... The most engaging story when he went abroad was at Thailand with his wife. Yeah. And she had basically the idea they ended up coming back, didn't they, in the back of a van. Because yeah. of various problems and they weren't sure they were going to get shot or something or kidnapped. Well, it, sounded, it sounded like he tried to make a good holiday for her and it just all went wrong. And when they got back, she then she broke her leg or something, didn't she? So. I think she broke her ankle or leg while she was over there. Yeah. On top of her fingers. <laughs> yeah. I found that really engaging but not funny. Yeah. And... Uh, so, anyway, is there anything else you want to say about the book, strength-wise? Um, no, I don't think so. I've got a few things I want to talk about, talk about with you on the possible weaknesses, OK? I don't think... I was surprised how little the book made me laugh during the time, didn't you? Yeah. Did you, did you find it... Did you find it engaging more than funny? Yeah, yeah, definitely engaging more than funny. Yeah. It was a bit of a... Um, I wasn't very wild on some elements of the book when you got into the VIP round, Joe, okay, Glastonbury. It came across a like, oh look, I've, I've got lots of money, money, money. Well, they I, won't really. It was showing you that, like, you just have to get to a certain point before you get it. And I don't think he bought his way into it. He just kind of blabbed his way into it. Yeah, it's, I, 
I think you lost a bit of the relatability to her. And, it was, and it was showing you that once you get there, it's not actually as great as what you think it is. Yeah, I, I didn't find it that bit. There was also the bit about the, the soccer aid bit as well. I found that a bit long-winded, some of the stories. And, and yeah. I just thought the book itself was one of those ones where you, when you're reading a book by a comic, you expect it to be fun, really, really funny, don't you? Yeah, I don't think it, it does say in the blurb though that it's about getting old and there might be some funny bits and that kind of sums it up, you know? Yeah, yeah, there was, um, I did read a comment, but somebody, somebody put this on me. I don't remember this in the book. I want to see if you remember this book, okay? okay. There was two people got upset by a comment in it. There was a reference on Amazon and somewhere else read this, one by another person. There was a reference to a comment that if the reader has never been to a comedy club, does not intend to go to one, then in his words, put the book down, piss yeah, off. <laughs> I do remember that. I don't think it said piss off, but it did say, like, put the book down because the rest of this is over you. I was like, well, fair enough. Yeah, it, that obviously beset and upset somebody that was. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't remember it, I'll be frank. Yeah, I do remember that bit. If it had been me that I've remembered, I'd perhaps have not been that keen in that either. Yeah. They say it was. If I'm honest, tell me you're doing with this. I saw it as a sort of thing you can read on holiday, really. Yeah. It's a holiday book, really, if you're going to sit by the beach, that sort of thing. Some are gentle and easy to read. Would you call it a masterpiece? No, but it was entertaining. It did, it did its job, I think. It didn't offend me, yeah. okay, so it was okay. It was okay. I've read a damn sight bloody worse so reading in bed. So, Mark's time, and then what are you going to give okay, this Okay, so to? I'm giving it 8 out of 10. I'm going to give it 7. It's a recommendation, okay. but it just... It was okay. okay. I mean, nothing more. Right, guys. Sorry for the waffle. We're in part one, isn't it, Amanda? We've gone for a while here today. Yeah, part so. one always goes on longer. Yeah. It'll get shorter, I promise. We hope. Right. <laughs> okay, guys. We'll take a quick break then. See you all in a minute. Bye. Bye bye. Reading and reading and bed. Reading and reading and bed. Welcome back to Reading in Bed, episode. 29. Yeah. I can't believe it's 29 episodes now, Amanda. I know. I know, guys. Listen, cut the waffle. Right, this time, start off with part two. I know it's your book this time, Amanda. The first of your two books. Yeah. What are you going to read? So this is called My Lies, Your Lies by Susan Lewis. Okay. And I'll read the blurb. Yes, please. Jolie tells other people's secrets for a living. As a ghostwriter, she's used to scandal. But this just might be her strangest assignment yet. Frida has never told her story to anyone before, but now she's ready to set the record straight and to right a wrong that's haunted her for 40 years. Frida's memoir begins with a 15-year-old girl falling madly in love with a teacher. It ends in a way Jolie could never possibly have imagined. As the story unravels, Jolie is spun deeper into a world of secrets and lies, delving further into Frida's past. Jolie's sure she can uncover the truth, but does she want to? Hmm. Uh, I've got a couple of questions in this book, honestly. The perks is sometimes guys and girls are doing novels. We know each other's read something, but I, can't, I couldn't ask you what told you what that book was until you read Tommy then. But what I'm interested in knowing is, first of all, this book is, where did, you, where did it come from? This was a pigeonhole book. I hazard a guess what drew you to this book. The ghostwriting bit. Yeah. Now... There's nothing to hide on this one, Amanda, is there? Because people know you did an audition fairly recently for a ghost writing, Yeah, I did a pair trial. I didn't get it for various reasons, but I learned a few lessons, which is the whole point of it sometimes, I think. And yeah. I also did a course that I got a certificate for with a memory. Yeah, and so I can hazard a guess why that's what drew you to this book straight away. Oh, it's a fiction book, isn't it, about ghost writing yeah. and choices and stuff like that. So, okay, what did you like about the book? Okay, so it starts off promising. Um, obviously, like I said, I was interested in the ghostwriter character. And then um, there's a lot of flashback scenes to the student and teacher relationship back in the 60s. And you can see that it's going to head into a way that's not allowed. Yeah, head into dodgy stuff. Isn't yeah. It? yeah. Yeah. Right, okay, so what else do you want to tell us about the Strength of the Book then? There must be other stuff I'm guessing. 
um, yeah, the first half was actually much better than the second half. It was like somebody took over writing, like they like maybe they had like a ghost writer. writer. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> In the oh. second half. Spoilers, spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, how many days? Um, obviously, we're pigeonholed and we'll never read it. You get given a chunk every day. You've got to read, haven't you? Yeah. Now, how many? Oh, how many days did this book get spread it's out? About on? between 10 and 13 i can't remember exactly so it's a fairly fairly reasonably long book run basically wasn't yeah. it yeah so i'm going to have to go into spoiler zone now anyone wants to, to tell you where yeah. the bits i don't like so that's the weaknesses so anyone who doesn't know the weaknesses skip about a couple minutes okay right so frida who's hired jolly to ghost write actually turns out to be the sister of the teacher where all along you're thinking she's the person that's had the affair mm-hmm. and she's Trying to get revenge on Jolie's mother, who was actually the student back in the day. So she somehow managed to find her daughter, who just happens to be a ghostwriter, to hire her as a ghostwriter to write a mother's story, because she's writing Frida's story. Oh, right, that's clever, that's clever, <laughs> isn't it? So. Yeah, and it all starts to go wrong when she locks Jolie up in this writing room, goes to see Jolie's mother. To get her to write what she thinks is the real story to finish off what Jolie started. And then there's Jolie tries to escape thinking that she's going to be there forever. And she falls from a tree, nearly dies. <laughs> and then it gets really stupid when the whole family sort of take Frida in, even though she's done this and caused this to happen to Jolie, who's like. The, so the mother and the brother who turned out, <laughs> this is getting confusing now, the mother who was obviously this was a student and the brother who turned out to be the son of Frida's brother who ended up killing himself when he went to prison for having an affair with the student. <laughs> which is why Frida wants to get revenge and they all take her in and just forget that, Frida, that Jolie nearly got killed because of this. Which seemed a bit far fetched. And the only person who seemed slightly bothered is Julie's husband. Like, why are you all acting like this? It's like she nearly killed my wife. <laughs> I'm speechless. I really am with that. So that kind of let it down as well. Was it a lot or just slightly? It was just, it just felt so unbelievable. Like, oh yeah, well, you nearly killed our family member, but well, it's okay, we understand you. You're just a bit eccentric, that's all. <laughs> Was this by a major publishing house, this book? I can't remember who published it. I'm surprised that they let them get away with that, yeah. Yeah. So, obviously, for that reason, I didn't find many of the characters that believable. Yeah, <laughs> I can just believe that that's true. It just, it just gets a bit... It sounds like one of these old books, what I can make out there, is it got off to a good start. Yeah. And some... Uh, well, they just... They had the rubs on the whole, nearly, didn't they? Yeah. Strange. So that's all I've really got to say before I give the mark. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like it's one of these sort of books, just to obviously to summarise really, where you could argue like the first half, what would you give the first half out of interest? I probably would have given it a nine if it had carried on in that kind of thing. But obviously, when it went downhill, yeah, obviously there was obviously you've got major concerns and after that, didn't you? So, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'm giving it a six overall out of ten. Because yeah. I can't quite recommend it because of the second half. Yeah, the second half has unfortunately not been that good, basically. So. Yeah, it just let itself down. It's so unfortunate. It's sometimes it's, I think there's a lesson to be learned from this, really, isn't it? Sometimes when you're doing a book, basically, wait, you, it's, did it feel like the writer was winging it to a degree then, didn't it, in the second half of it? Yeah, it just felt like a complete different writer, like I said, like a ghostwriter. Yeah, <laughs> it does sound like to me. Do you think, tell me if you agree with this, where they had the first half of the book plotted out. Yeah. That it seemed like something went wrong with the plotting on the second line. Why they went down that direction? Yeah, then? everything seemed believable until they all started welcoming Frida into the family, despite what she'd done, and just forgive her. Like, oh, you almost killed me, but it's all right. We understand you're just a bit eccentric. Yeah. <laughs> That's just how you are. Yeah, it's one of them. Hmm. Unusual. That's yeah. where I'm putting it to you. Oh dear. Unfortunately, guys, it does happen with books sometimes, man, but that doesn't it really sometimes where it doesn't lose in the second half. And shape. just sounds like, like it could have been an interesting book if it carried on doing what it should have done. So. But hey, ho. Yeah, so time for the next part. Okay. And dun 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 d
I can't the rest of the thing. Sure. Right, anyway, guys and girls. Right, Amanda. Should we go and wander on? Yeah. Okay, guys. Watch your space. See you in a minute. Bye. Reading the bed. Reading the bed. Welcome back to Reading in Bed with me, Amanda Steele, and. Amanda Steele. Oh, sorry, I'm here. I went in that mood. Okay, guys. Whose turn is that, Amanda? You're doing the robot now, aren't you? No, it's you. Oh, is it my own? Bugger. Amanda, yes, okay, right. Okay, of course, now. I know about this book already, so. Bizarrely enough, uh, two of the three books I've done this month were autobiographies. And would you ever hear me do that? Not often. Not often, no. This one I actually read before the John Bishop one, so this is what I've been wanting to read for quite a while, so. And the writer is Tom Baker. Who is Tom Baker, I remember? One of the Doctor Who's. Yeah. I'm asking Amanda, who on earth is Tom Baker? <laughs> That's not the second type of book, is who on earth is Tom Baker? <laughs> anyway. You've got a warning as well, haven't you? Yes, I do. Well, seriously, before I get on to this in a minute, there is a scene in this that I'm going to have to describe. It comes in one of the strengths that um, is shocking. So it does have, this is adult material. I'll warn you if I go into this, okay? Yeah. Okay, are we done the blood? Yeah. Okay. The hilarious, rombustious, and gloriously indiscreet autobiography of the most famous and best loved Doctor Who. Tom Baker's autobiography covers his childhood in the poor, spirited Irish community in Liverpool, which I didn't know he was from Liverpool. Never knew that. During which time he developed a penchant for lying, a passion for football, and a suspicion of priests. He's six years as a monk, when he spent much time to avoid eye contact with others. He struggled at times as an out of work actor and on appearances alongside Olivier at the National Theatre, to his work with Pasolini, and finally his time as the ultimate Doctor Who. Far exceeding the usual expectations are actually autobiography. Who on earth is Tom Baker? He's a blackly comic screen. Baker is the kind of man that could drink the old off the wagon onto Hopkins under the table, which was talked about in the book. He was a natural writer of rabblism, whatever that is, or at least of scat, scat spike milligan proportions. And of course, the most famous faces in the British acting world. Okay, so what are the strengths? Right, okay, it's a very, very strange book, this one. <laughs> that's, that's putting it nicely. Yeah, it's an interesting blurb. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's one of those ones where John Bishop, what we read, I've read after, was fairly straightforward. This isn't. <laughs> okay. And it was, um, I didn't like John Bishop, I didn't, I didn't know a lot about Tom Baker. I knew it was Doctor Who days. They also did a film, the Sinbad films. Well, I'll come on to that in a bit, so okay. But it's a strange, strange book because the book itself, he starts off with his childhood from a very, very poor working class background in Liverpool. I didn't know he was actually born in Liverpool. And the bit, bit he lived in, he grew up, because he's back in 80 now. When you think of yourself like he was in the early 40s, he was very, very poor in the Second World War. And it was quite, it's very, very surprising with his honesty. And there was a scene in it. And this is when we're going to be blunt now, okay? Yeah. Where him and his schoolmates, obviously when they hit puberty, went to watch a woman walking around on the back of the school and they treated her like a wanker to us. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking, I mean, all kids actually was cocked by so I thought, I don't really believe him, he did this. <laughs> and so we like it, it was like, and that was really, really old, you know, just be thinking, right. And this came up pretty quick early on in the book. I'm thinking to myself, I thought, I don't believe he's just revealed that. <laughs> was this the woman that was just walking by your... No, she had underwear she, on. Walking so, so she was specifically walking there for them to one No, her. no, she was back in the back room, basically. Oh, right. And apparently they knew she was... One of the lads knew that she was walking around the back room a lot wearing oh, underwear. Yeah. So it wasn't there for her. Okay. <laughs> it was like six, I think five or six young men. Like kids are teenagers oh. doing that. <laughs> Like I said, it was like, you understand it's what I mean? It's a group bonding experience. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, as you can see, guys, um, we do read these books sometimes. They don't tell each other about stuff like this, do we? No. I was like, and I thought, I'm going to say that to you, man, because I just couldn't believe it. I just absolutely couldn't believe it when it came up. I thought, fucking hell. And that's why I thought, it was... Well, then, like, you, you had some little scenes in it later on where it seemed to be like... Then he became, like I said, a priest afterwards for six years. 
And considering that what a Hellraiser is known for happening was a Doctor Who, he was known alcoholic he was. Yeah. And a serial womanizer of Doctor Who. He married he married his second wife under Doctor Who and cheated on him with his third as well, not long after. And so but I said, but you got this um and then there was a story about when he went to acting where he completely drunk Sir Ant Hopkins under the table. Yeah. And Ant Hopkins was an old Hellraiser back in the day as well, so it just it was just basically it was um all it was just the surprising stuff he was coming out he was coming out with. But what he did was and this what it, the strengths of the book really were. You said already with the John Bishop book, didn't you? What was your strength, John Bishop? You felt like it was him, didn't you? Yeah. You could tell it was him straight away with this. It had this sense of humour by him, but I've seen enough interviews of him. And it was I suspected probably they must have had a ghostwriter again, but just to help him tie the other stuff up. Yeah. And it seemed to work really, really well in places and that it did. But it was a very vivid book, I so put it nicely to you and it was pretty easy to read again, so Okay, There's a few things else I want to talk about because it's the book's turned off for everybody because there's there's big elements in the book where he almost like he doesn't care if you want you want to read the book or you even like him or not. And it's a very, very sad story, really. But told with a lot of very um, you know like Liverpool and Manchester, we have very gallows humour, don't we? Yeah. The gallows humour's throughout this book basically like that. And I would like to know more about Dr. Ruth. Yeah. There's two chapters of Doctor Who, isn't it? I suppose, really, it's only a small part of yeah. his life, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it I've might just... be what he's known for, but it's yeah. only a small part of it. Yeah, I, think what I would hope he goes a full book on Doctor Who, because it like he, he caused a lot of problems in the scenes there, he's yeah. telling what he, what he would and wouldn't do, so. But, um, did you know he did in, he was in one of the Sinbad films? No, but I never really liked them, so I didn't watch them. Yeah, he did one in, I think it's just on Doctor Who, got the Golden Voyage of Sinbad, he played the baddie. And my dad played that thing a year or so after he left Doctor Who, about 10 or 11, I was heartbroken. And I was shocked he played this played a really good snarling, menacing baddie in it, yeah. he did. But that wasn't mentioned. Nothing about that at all. The other thing he was famous for. And, and I didn't know, when I mentioned Pasolini before, Pablo Pasolini was one a famous art house Italian director. And I'll let you read up on Sunday and everybody else listening how he died. It's the film itself, that one. But um and the collapse of one of his marriages was not even touched at all. So it's almost like he was like, after you like to be a big tease sometime, you know what I mean? You, oh I can't bother telling you that. Yeah, well I suppose it depends how long you wanted the book to be. Yeah, well, I read it in like five hours, so yeah, so yeah. It, it wasn't no longer an ambitious book, so. But anyway, I loved it though. <laughs> Oh, anything else you want to say before you give it a name? No, it does not told the answer, so. What do you reckon I give it? It's going to be a recommendation, I think. Eight and a half out of ten. I really enjoyed it. Really, really engaging book. It took me about four and a half hours, so. But, no, yeah, I would like to, I would like to more, but. What's the word, Amanda? It is what it is? Yeah. Right, guys and girls. That's the end of part three. I think the next part's going to be something a bit shorter, Amanda, isn't it? Yeah, we've got an anthology. Yeah, so. That's the clue. Short. I'm full of you, right? So, <laughs> see you all in a minute, too, okay? Bye. Read in the bed. Read in the bed. Hi, guys and girls. Welcome back to Reading in Bed, episode 29, with Amanda Steele and Andy M. This is part four, as I said before, and the hint we gave before, Amanda, what was it? I said something short, didn't I? Yeah. So, what, is, what, what do I mean, Amanda? We need an anthology of short stories. Well, yes, eh? Hey, we like leaving our readers, or listeners, I should say, for the clues. Yeah. Are we okay? And this, I know it's a, a short story anthology. What's the short anthology called? It's called Given in Evidence, and it's by various authors, obviously. Now, how did you find out about this book? This was another pigeonhole book. Oh, well, that was you doing this one. Yeah. And, okay, how long did it take to go for this book, then? Um, ten days, one story a day. Ah, I thought I thought I'd show it. Yeah, of course so. Okay, give us the blurb then. Okay. Ten ingenious and exhilarating short stories in one collection, a murderous feud in a seemingly quiet country village, a haunted hotel with one particular difficult guest, a hostage situation gone horribly wrong, featuring stories from acclaimed and best selling authors. Given in Evidence is an anthology that showcases the best in contemporary crime and thriller writing. Right, okay, and when I say the best, and 
Is it new writers or quite established ones? I didn't really look up to see whether they were new or established, but some of them felt modern, some felt a bit old, but I think they were sort of meant to be that way, like Midsummer Murders, sort of somewhere yeah. in, in that kind of style. Yeah. Was there any writers you actually knew in it? No, but I don't really read a lot of crime authors. Okay. Or if I do, they're just indie ones. Yeah, of course. What drew you to this book then? I thought, well, I've got my first crime book out that's a paranormal crime, so it's not just straightforward crime. And I thought, you know, start reading more crime, and it might inspire me to write it's like short stories. Cool. Okay, then. So, what are the strengths? Okay, so there was a couple of stories that I enjoyed. Um, there was one, which a slight spoiler alert here, called Room 2 to 8, even though I've read similar kinds of things before. And there's a guest in there, and he's looking for room two to eight and he won't book into any other room and they're adamant that there isn't such thing until later on it turns out in the book that there was such thing but somebody died in there and then it also turns out that the person who died has the same name as the person who was trying to book into that room oh, <laughs> anyway, right. I, did, I did enjoy it, it was well written but you could see where it was going yeah, I've got the trouble is sometimes with crime books sometimes is it's particularly short stories it comes obvious sometimes don't yeah it? but so sometimes you know where the story is going but it's well, well written so mm. at least you know you enjoy getting there even though you know where it's going yeah yeah i'll get you seriously okay so okay is there anything else you want to talk about the strength of this book no i do have some weaknesses okay let's go on to the weaknesses then yeah there was at least half of them that were like opening chapters or extracts from a novel that made you want to read the rest of the book so you've got to go out and buy the book in addition to having the anthology which that's I've never come across before that's a bit of a cop out isn't it yeah it's, it's, a bit, it's very cheeky is it by a major publisher this year can you remember I can't remember who it does it I've, I've come across I've reviewed books before now where they've gone on bought gone along and basically put two or three chapters at the end and they've got two other books and did that the authors wrote I've never known people do that before yeah, it was very strange. A lot of people were very annoyed because you got comments as well as you going along. And there was at the end where people were figuring out it was either a short story that was based on a full novel or like an extract. And they weren't impressed. And you weren't impressed either, were you? No. No, I've been, right, I've been rather miffed on that, to put it nicely. So, But on the quality of the storytelling, and how many hits did you think there was? Mm, I enjoyed about three of them, I think. There was a couple that tried to be too clever, like there's a twist here and this is a twist, and then there's all these people, that, even though it's a short story, and try and keep up with who everybody is, and you just can't, it gets too confusing. Yeah. It's like in a novel it might work, because you could introduce them gradually throughout the novel, but throwing like maybe 10 or 15 people into a short story is no, too much. Too much. I think I'm always a firm believer, and why I've wrote short stories badly over the years, and you, you can say this more than me. It's always best to keep it as simple as you can. Yeah. Be clever, but keep the structure. Don't overload it with stories. Make me short story. Remember, right, you pretend you agree in this. If you put the short story in there, every person's got me in that story for a reason. Yeah. I know, like in real life, you've got loads of family and friends and stuff, but that doesn't mean that in the fiction it has to imitate it. You just have a selection of those family and friends. Yeah. Sound like there's a major problem with that one straight away. Oh dear, that's not good. I'm sorry. To... Is there anything else you don't like about it? I think I've covered it now. <laughs> As you can see, guys and girls, Amanda's in a positive mood. Why aren't you in this one today? Who said so? Now, I let me have a guess. Let me, sit, let me pause for a second. Let me try and work out. We're looking at Amanda now. You can't see this, obviously. This is the video audio podcast, but we're looking at a video. Hmm. I reckon she's going to give us a 9 out of 10. Okay, so there were a few I might have given seven or eight to separately. Do you to, can but you remember which those stories were, seriously? There was the hotel room one, even though it was a little bit predictable. I can't remember the other two. Uh, overall, obviously, I'm rating the anthology as a whole, so I have to give it a five out of ten, unfortunately. Oh dear, that's not good at all, that one. So it's unfortunate that a guy's a girl's, but it's, there's, a, there's a lesson to be learned there, Amanda, basically, in different publishers. If you go around doing stunts like that, and then if you bring another book out sick a year later and anthology, what, what are people going to do that know it? Yeah, no they're problem. just going to think, well, no, because it's not an anthology. 
Yeah. Even if it really is an anthology, they're not going to give you another chance, are they? No. It's almost, you don't really imagine a lot of anime. I'm digressing here in a way, but you know, like, you ever, have you ever got hold of compilation CDs of acts? Yeah. Sometimes you get a lot of compilation one by a label. They're all along for our tracks along by the album, by the, by the artist one for each album. This feels like it's that nearly, doesn't it? Nearly. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't pay for it. If I'd paid for it, I wouldn't have been happy. Me would have been a paper bit of book, it might have gone out the window, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and the Kindle would have been like, delete. Annoyed. Delete annoyed, yeah, so. Fortune Guys, so it's 5 out of 10 among the beta, wasn't it? So yeah. it's Fortune it Guys, it's not a recommendation. So, anyway, guys and girls, that's it for part four. Where are we going next, Amanda? We're getting all poetic next. Yeah, we have a list of couple books, haven't we? Poets Corner, so. No. I like to finish it off with Bowie's Corner, so, and hang around. We'll see you all in a minute. Take care. Bye. Bye. Read in a bed. Read in a bed. Read in a bed. Read in a bed. Welcome back to the last part of Reading in Bed, episode 29, with me, Amanda Steele, and... Me, Andy. Right, we're on to Poets Corner today again, Amanda, aren't we, and I said? Yeah. We haven't done this in ages. I have not done Poets Corner in ages, and... I picked up a Kindle book because a friend of ours bought a book out a couple months, a couple months ago now, and I knew knew about it and I wanted to read the review at last month, but I didn't have a chance. So, and I've got to give an adult warning on this one because this book does cover adult material and does have a bad language. Well, I think by now the whole episode has an adult warning. <laughs> yeah, there's um, several <laughs> topics in it. So, okay, what do you want to do, Amanda? First of all, Mr. Blood. Yes, but I tell people who the author is first, haven't I? Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, it's by a lady called Alicia Fitton. I've actually interviewed Alicia um, last year, was it? I think from? so, yeah. Was it, was it was a bit back, it was yeah. relatively recently. So I, did have a sp- I interviewed her. Uh, I, d- I don't remember someone suggesting to you, but I can't remember how long yeah, it was. Yeah, um, it was our friend Janie Colburn. Yeah. I knew Janie, who I also interviewed for Spoken Label. I think I interviewed Alicia about a year ago. And she's bought out a poetry collection. It's, it's, I think it was a chapbook basically. I think it had 22 poems in memory is correct. So, do you want the blurb? Yeah. The blurb is this. This debut collection from Alicia Fitton is a lyrical exploration of the lies we tell ourselves about the sex we want and the people we long for. Her work flits like a summer romance telling storms through snapshots of erotic desire, wish fulfillment, guilt, and a resulting heartbreak. Each poem is personal and intimate, inviting the reader into an emotional journey fraught with jagged edges. That's a good blurb, that, isn't yeah. it? Right, I said, um, okay. Also, a bit more on the blurb, I'll tell you the rest of it out. Perfect for anybody who wants to fall in or out of love. What do you want to start with? With the strengths. Right, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to do here, Amanda. I wrote down. I'm going to do an extract from three of the poems, okay? Yeah. And can I read these out to you and we'll talk about them? You tell me okay. you tell me what you were thinking on the scene, okay? Do it that way. Yeah. Right, okay. Well, we were working out before. I know. Do you remember the first time we met Alicia? I don't remember. I remember the first time I saw her reading out, but I don't yeah. remember the first time. That was her. Uh, I got to talk with her in the podcast a bit later on, but first time was when we were Do you remember how terrified she was? Well, see, when you was interviewing him, I turned up at the last part. Oh, no, no, no. No, that was before. I was seeing a read over at um, a night called World Central and managed to twice. Yeah. Well, maybe three but times. The first yeah. time I met him, I think, was then. Yeah. And well, you was trying to drag me into the podcast, and I don't like being dragged into <laughs> You were doing something giggling and tormenting yeah. me, yeah. Now, the first time I remember Alicia, and it's a, there's a good example to do a comparison with Amanda here with this, is she got called up at the end of right at the bottom of a big reserve list for World Central. Yeah. And she went on stage and she was physically shaking because she hadn't expected to get called up. And do you remember the first time you were like that, Amanda? It was very well nice to be easy, weren't you? Yeah, I think I was much worse. I don't recall her shaking, to be honest. Yeah, I think it's weird when you're doing it yourself, it's a different ball game, isn't it? So, yeah. And it's like, in Alicia's case, what then she read the town, mm. so after, definitely one after that, and our friend Janie Coleman told me I had to interview her. She's that good. Because oh, I remember, I think Ruth was at the other side of me, and Janie was there. Yeah. And I think Janie was trying to get your attention, so I had to nudge you, and then you were like talking on. Yeah. She was going, interview her. Yeah, okay, <laughs> that's what I thought. I tracked her down, yeah. yeah. I was, and 
It was interesting earlier because I think when I read this book, it, you always look back at it and you see people the first time, terrified they are. But in this case, this is quite this is a quietly confident book. So okay, um, the blurb of the book is the book is filled with emotional journeys, and there's quite a lot of sexual tension in this book. So that's why there's an adult warning with this book. Yeah. Now the first piece I want to read a part about is um, from a film called Pretending. Okay. Okay. So I'm not read Alicia. I'm not Alicia. I respect for her. I am not reading out the full poem. Any of these? Yeah. These are all extracts. And this is the last six lines of the poem, and I want. See what see we see what a man thinks of the technique is. So I think this is well wrote. Okay. And um, this is a symbolism of talking about um, like I think the, the narrator is a nightclub watching a woman dancing on the dance floor. Okay. The fuckery smile, the just us wink, lead you down a well lit path. The shadows thin, but still you dance. We can we can see you flirting. We can all see you flirting. So I like that. Do you like the repetition at the end of that? Yeah. It's really clever because like the full poem is basically making it sound as one person looking at it. Yeah. And for that we all, it symbolises that everybody knows what this person's like. Yeah. And I thought this of it gives it a different sort of focus at the end of it. Yeah. Now, what do you think about that for writing wise? Yeah, it's good. I think it's, yeah, I, I liked it because I felt it changed gears from what we write at the end of it, it changes the focus of the poem, and I thought that's good writing straight away. And there was another piece of mine that's a favourite of mine as well, called Radio Silence. And this is different to pretending in the sense of it's was Radio Silence set in a busy and busy bar and club, I guess. This is at home dealing with silence and different yeah. sort of atmosphere together. So I'll read out to you. I think this was the last seven lines again, okay. The airwaves crackle with restless energy, the static of hungry expectation. The length never stretches on and on, waiting for the elastic to snap, waiting for you to come back to me. Do you like the elastic band there? Yeah, I like that. The elastic band's a really clever image on that. That's what Alicia's very, very good at. She has these slight undercurrents of the images. And the elastic band's like it's pulling the person back. It's suggested to me in the piece, either they'd split or it was a rebound going on there constantly. Yeah. We're on off relationship. And I liked about it was who this was. And there was a lot of very, very, very restless energy in a lot of these poems. And I think that's what they just really good at is characters. We we, we, didn't, we published one, didn't we? Over at Printed Words. And yeah. I remember that one yeah. had a fantastic character which is in this book. Don't ask which one. But there's a last in this book, but there's a lot of lonely, frightened narrators in this book. In piece like the companion piece and Friday night. Uh, there's also one or two in them that are really, really erotic, like Flight and Run Dry, which I think I'm completely the wrong person to judge because I don't necessarily get, get my head around erotic poetry very much. I think mean, I know you write it, but. Not in like an arousing way. Mine's more like a taking the piss kind of way. Yeah, hers are very, very yeah. central in the way. And I think I'm probably the wrong person to judge content wise in those pieces. But the technical ability and work is brilliant and it's very, very understated. And it's it's a page each poem's laced with detail and not the case of do you understand what I mean when I say sometimes the best poetry is not the fact it tells you everything. Yeah. It's fact like it, it makes you work for it. I thought she did a really good collection there for a, for a chapbook face. Some book is chapbook fantastic. Yeah, so I'm guessing there's probably not any weaknesses or not much. I've got one. Mm-hmm. It's quite simple. Hurry up and bring out a full length collection. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Alicia. <laughs> it's like a preview in a way, don't yeah. it, when you bring out a chat book? Yeah, I think it is. And I think she did a fantastic job with this. No two is about it. Really, really recommended poetry book. And what do you come to give it out of 10? Well, it's going to be a recommendation. I'm guessing it's going to be an 8 or 9. I'm going to give it a 9. It's well worth, well worth your time. And the thing is, it's only £2 on the Kindle Store in the UK at the moment. And for me, 22 pounds and I'm mostly very, very high quality. It's well worth your time. Yeah, so go out, buy it, read it, give it a good review. Yeah, and sweat constantly like I was in places <laughs> during as well. <laughs> but seriously, excellent, excellent preview. Okay. That's it, Amanda. Yeah, that's it for this month. Yeah, so... Are we going to give the clues away what we're reading next month? 
I've got a demonic story, which I picked up because it slightly reminded me of one of my books, but it's oh, just different that enough. Yeah, that's not. that's not the one I'm reading, the one you're reading by yourself, I'm yeah. on it, yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm doing a Paul Auster book called Sunset Park, and we're reading another one by a local writer, aren't we? Yeah, Joseph Joseph Knox. Knox. I can't contain the name of the book, I've forgotten it. Sirens. I'm, Sirens. So I'm about 35 cents into that, and my 20 cents to Paul Auster, so. And I've got a side and a third book myself, but you've got those two, and do you know what your third book's going to be? Yeah, and it's going to be a book called Humankind, which is a non fiction book. What made you going to do here, a non fiction book? This was another pigeonhole book. You and your pigeonhole books? <laughs> and look, because obviously I don't have enough books on my own that I have to keep getting through books. Yeah. Anyone knows Amanda's shoes in, in our little living room? There is an absolute stack of books you've not read yet in the cell. Yeah, well, I thought I was saving them for the end of the world, but now it is the end of the world, and I still not got around to yeah. reading them. And yet. how many books have you got in your Kindle now, then, on the road? I don't like to say, but I think there could be nearly a hundred. If anyone's wondering if this podcast is going to go fortnightly, it might be, in fact, me asking Amanda a lot of questions here if she has to clear all them out. Read faster, read faster. More, read more, read more. Stop buying, stop buying. Stop Go. sleeping, start reading. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's serve it, guys, okay? That's it for this, this episode. Thank you again, as always, guys. And stay safe. Yeah. Stay and, safe. And read some books. Yeah, read books, read books. Stay safe, stay safe, read books. Boris Johnson, make a note of that. It's what Amanda Rupert is in. Stay sane, stay safe. Read, read books. books. Yeah, that's a good, that's a better slogan. I like that. <laughs> Take care, guys. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Read in a bed and bed. Read in a bed and bed. He lurked in the shadows, waiting and hoping she wouldn't take a different room. This was a usual room. He knew that. He knew her. Ghost of Me, the new book by Amanda Steele, can be found at Amazon. Cobol, Wardstones, and many, many other places. Read in the bed and bed. Read in the bed and bed.